So today's tutorial data, it's already in box. So if you want to follow along, just go to the 02 cartography two folder. And I have a few data sets that I've downloaded for today's tutorial in here. So you can download those in the background, but I'm also going to tell you where I got these from. So that if you want more data from different areas, uh, you can find your own data. Today's topic is going to be about census and socioeconomic data. This is data that is publicly available um, as part of data that created by the US census and the American community survey. First link that I'm going to give you is this one right here this uh, cartographic boundaries files. This is the GIS data set that you want to use to host all of the data that you gather from census. This link here, if I scroll through this list here, has a bunch of different boundaries at different scales in the United States, whether it's cartographic boundaries at the census block, census track, congressional districts, cities, counties. This data here is important because this is data that you can use to link census data to. So think of uh, census data as two things. One's a geographic file, this stuff that you see here, and another one is the actual tabular data that you download from censusbureau.com. The data sets that I gave you for today's tutorial, I downloaded from here. Uh, if you see where my mouse is hovering, this census block groups section right here. What I did was I downloaded the data for Alabama. So what you basically do is you click on this arrow here and you choose the state. And when you click on the state, it automatically downloads something. So let me create a new map and we'll show you what that information looks like. So I have ArcGIS Pro open now and I'm going to create a new map census tutorial and then i'm going to connect to the folder that has that data so i am just going to go right click on my catalog on the side choose add folder connection and i'm going to go to uh, where i save my data which is on my desktop and in here i have those files that i downloaded from including this one right here which is that bg 500k block groups if i bring that in this is what you get the next thing I'm going to do as well is just because, again, I emphasized this last time, is always just make sure that you are using the right coordinate system. So I'm just going to go to coordinate systems, and I'm just going to change it to the Mercator projection. This data set here, if I go to the attribute table, so I right click on the layer and click attribute table, you'll see that this data set doesn't have much information specifically as it relates to census data, but it does have some information that we can use to link census data to this. And specifically, it's this line right here, this geo ID. This number here is basically an index or a code that you can use to join data to this map. I'm going to go back to the browser and we're going to go to the second link right here. This link is the data.census.gov link. So this is where you go to download all census and demographic data for uh, all the states in the US. And I'll try to walk through this process of working through this website. There's a, basically just a really, really deep, rich database of information that you can find in this site here. The first step you want to do is go to this geography button on the left right there. And that allows you to define the geography type that will be used to link data to the map that we downloaded. And if you remember, we download the block group geography for Alabama. So I'm going to click on block group right there. And then it shows all these states uh, in the United States that we can choose from. We're going to choose Alabama. So I'm going to check this box, all block groups within Alabama. Then what I'll do is I'm going to go down to this filter on the left side and I'm going to choose topics. And this is where you can begin to find specific types of data within that block group, Alabama. The data that I downloaded was basic population data. So what I did was I chose this populations and people option right there. And then I checked this populations and people box right there. And then once you have these two filters, and I'm just going to go all the way down to the, the lower right corner and I choose search. And this allows you to download tabular data for that specific filter right there. These are all the census data sets that you can download. Expand this list and begin to look through all the different categories here. The one that I downloaded is this total population data set right here. So whenever you download data, you try to go for that 2020 data set whenever you can find it. And so I downloaded this one here, 2020 uh, ACS, which stands for American Community Survey. If you click on that, it basically allows you to download information with this button right there. That allows you to download data from uh, 2020. And you see, as the, and I click on that, you can see in the bottom right corner, it's setting up a file that you can download for that area. The data set that I downloaded was not this one. It was, yeah, it was this one right here, this race one. And I downloaded this DEC redistricting data. When you finish downloading that information, you basically get a, an Excel table like this. This is the raw data that you get straight from the census website. 
and you have a couple of tables, these CSV files. If I open the first one, the metadata, you'll see that this table here shows all the lines of data that are categorized within this data set. The next one here, this data CSV, this is the actual data. When I look at spreadsheets like this, it makes me happy. And the reason I say that is because I like data. I like my data to be organized in a tabular format because this gives you so much power to visualize a lot of information really efficiently. So the first thing I always recommend doing whenever you uh, see this big list here that's really confusing, you need to clean it up. Basically choose all the data by clicking on that upper left arrow. And I'm gonna go to the format button in the tab of Excel and I'm gonna choose auto fit column width. That just makes it so that nothing is being hidden by like a really narrow column. And now you can actually see the actual ID number. There are some columns in this data set here that you see really don't have any meaningful information. If there is only one line of data, no, 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 for the entire data set, it's basically no data. A very easy way to delete a bunch of columns that you don't want, go to the find and select button there choose find and then all these columns that are null basically have this title of annotation so i'm just going to type in annotation then choose find all and then this gives me all the cells that have that word in it so i'm just going to shift select all these and then i'm just going to hit this delete delete sheet columns and now that those columns are now if i go back to the to the end here are now gone and so we'll do again, we'll do the replace right below the find the replace option. And now what we're going to do is anything, anytime you see those two exclamation marks, I'm just going to type in two exclamation marks and we're going to replace it with nothing. So you choose, choose that. And then that just cleans that up. And then the last thing I'm going to do the colon right there. So this is total population um, colon. Sometimes GIS doesn't like the use of this uh, notation. And so it's better to use either no, no um, commas, colons, semicolons, and replace them with say underscores. So I'm just going to replace all the colons in here with an underscore. And then another thing we can do is we can tighten up the actual name of this uh, so that's not as long. So you can you can go through this as much as you want, but that right there is a pretty decent cleaned up data set. The last thing we're gonna do before we uh, bring this into GIS is, right, this thing actually has two title columns. You see here, there's the title column up here, which um, the actual code for this particular category. GIS does not like it, does not like to have two columns. So we're just gonna take this top column here, which is a little bit hard to decipher because it's all in code, and we're just gonna delete that. I'm gonna do file, save as, I'm going to save it onto my desktop somewhere, Al pop for Alabama population. And we're going to save it as a CSV, a .csv file. I choose save. And now we can go into GIS. And then in the data folder, I'm going to refresh this. You see this Al pop CSV. That's the one we just exported. I'm going to bring that in. And so when you bring in a table into GIS, it comes in as a standalone table at the base of the table of contents. And if you open that, you'll see that all the data that we've cleaned up, including that geography, these names, the actual data itself in the terms of the population, that's now in there. Now the next process is taking this table and this table and combining them together. And so the tool that we're going to use is join. Go to the data table that I want to use as the host. You want this to be your main data set and you want stuff to connect to that. And what you do is you right click on that layer and then you go to this joins and relates option right there. And then there's this add join button right there. So I click on that. And now it's going to ask for an input join field. So the first table is the input table is the, the actual data set. That's again, the, the main data set they want information to join to. And the join field is going to be that geo ID uh, that you remember indicated was the key to connect these two data sets. So that's key one. Then the join table is going to be the Alpop CSV. Alabama population and the join table field is going to be the geography right here. We need the input field and the join field to be the same thing. And if you get that correct, you just click OK. And then in the data set for the actual block groups here. Now, if I scroll through the attribute table here, you'll see now that you have population, uh, white race, black race, American Indian. That's now all tied to an actual location on this map. And now all you do is you visualize this in, in however way you want. We're going to right click on that guy, choose symbology, and then we're going to symbolize this by population right there. I'm going to click on the drop down arrow and we're going to choose this one called graduated colors. Choose that. 
And uh, right now it automatically uh, chooses the A land, which is area. We're gonna choose population. Total was the total population. And now you see basically it maps out population for each block group. And you can change the color ramp here. Uh, you can create your own color ramps. Uh, the way you create a custom color ramp is you basically choose a color ramp from this list here. Say, let's try this one, format color scheme. So it allows you to pick the low value, the high value, and the mid value. This is where your color color theory comes into play. And I'm not going to pretend like I'm a master of color theory. Let's say you want to do something like this. And then once you come up with your own color ramp, you simply choose save to a style. I'll call this one color ramp. Okay, I have a question for the studio. What about this map makes sense? And what about it does not make sense? All right, so I'll just I'll, I'll tell you what is slightly problematic about this map is that it does not take into account the area of the block group. So for instance, this is a huge block group as a compared to maybe a smaller one here. And so this goes into a topic of what's called normalization, this second line right here. This is how you begin to make maps make sense is that you take into account some kind of factor that represents this number as a part of a whole. And what you get is something more like a percentage. Basically, we're going to do in this normalization menu down there, we're going to choose the area, which is a land. A land, this is a, a line that is already in the block group data set. If I choose that, you'll see what happens is that this map changes significantly. It now takes into account out in the country, out in the rural areas of Alabama, there's less density of people. And this makes a little bit more sense if you think about it where people tend to be aggregated in the cities, right? They are density in the cities. That's where the greatest congregational population is. And then the rural areas, it's just way more spread out. In classes right here, right now there's five breaks right there. I'm gonna choose 20, just to add a lot of variation to this. And then I'm going to choose uh, in this method here, right now it's set to natural breaks. I'm gonna choose geometric interval. And think of these, all these options as just simple ways to determine how these uh, values are broken up. So if I choose like, say for instance, geometric interval, which is my preferred method for census data, you can see that it kind of adds a little bit more of a subtle gradient to this population map where it's it feels denser in the cities, but then as it spreads out to the suburbs and then eventually the rural areas, it begins to make a little bit more sense. And then what I'll do is uh, I'm going to get rid of all the boundaries for the block groups. So I'm going to choose in this symbology tab right here, choose this drop down menu here, choose format all symbols. And then I'm going to go to this properties button there. And then an outline color, I'm just going to choose no color. Then choose apply at the bottom of this symbology option there. And then eventually this will update. Once the boundaries go away, it's a little bit clear because then you actually can see the, the color in the map. So uh, the best way to, to see what is happening is to just go to the histogram right here, this right here. And you can see this is how those intervals are being broken up based off of this option there. If I choose, say, for instance, equal interval, what happens is it just makes it so that these breaks are way more equivalent. So if you ask me, the best way to understand what each one of these do is just simply just go through this and see how it changes this histogram. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go into here, and you can see that the this population data set that of Alabama does also include race as well. So if I choose, for instance, white, when I put the population, say, for instance, of, of the white population here, this doesn't look significantly different, say, for instance, from the, the population map. Whenever you're representing something like race, what you are probably better off showing is not necessarily the, the white population as it relates to the area, but the white population or any race that you've chosen as it relates to the total population itself. So you get percentage, the white population amongst the total people there. Normalization field here, instead of using land, I'm going to choose total. And the results, as you can see here, this now shows very specifically areas that are high in, in this case, white population and low in white population, high being red and low being blue. And so the reason I bring this map up, that the map dictates a lot of how the, the politics and, and the inner workings of the country work. If I change the white to the other race, which is uh, Black or African-American, significant portion of Alabama that is heavily African-American, you can see that the, the breaks over here, where it's red, essentially it's 90% uh, um, African-American, then as it gets blue, it almost gets to zero. I'm going to make a, a very political point here, and I apologize for my political points here, but if you 
bring in this data set here, this CD116. This is what's the congressional districts of the United States. And this is how elections are basically controlled in our country. If I bring in this congressional districts layer in here and change the color of this fill to be no color and then the outline just to be like a black and we'll make it like a one point um, layer right there. You see what has happened is essentially what these congressional districts are, the way that elections are controlled in the country is we simply draw our boundaries in such a way where there are no competitive elections where we basically put all people, let's say, of African-American into one congressional district, like you see right here, and take, say, for instance, what could be another competitive district, say this district right here, probably should be uh, a district that is competitive because it has a good mix of of races, but essentially carving out all that into one district. And this is what's known as gerrymandering, if you ever heard or read about political literature out there. And this is why Americans are cynical. It's because we we say vote, 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 but how can you how can you vote, vote, vote when your votes don't change the country? This is one of those big issues that I'm not sure how we we overcome if your if your districts are being basically drawn in such a way where you are uh, not being put into a position of competitiveness. The map dictates a lot. The next topic we're going to go to is how to create your own data um, from uh, your own uh, research lists of data. For this example here, I just found a really simple list right here. So um, this here is an Excel spreadsheet of all the landscape architecture programs in the United States. And you just find a, find any kind of data set, any kind of tabular data set. And if you can find a tabular data set, you can just copy and paste that into uh, an Excel spreadsheet. And what you're looking for is simply a location. And that location can be coordinates or it can be an address. In this case, we have an address, a city and a state. If you have a tabular data set with some kind of thing, whether it's a school and a location, that can be mapped. You'll see here that the schools, there are some duplicates because some schools have BLA programs and some schools have MLA programs. But just for the purposes of our mapping here, we just want to make sure that let's just do MLA programs. Click on a column here and let's say the program there and then go to this filter button in Excel right there. If I choose filter, you see that the columns all of a sudden have this little arrow that you can drop down and then basically searches through the column and try to create a culmination of all the data that is in that column. And so what we can do is just go uncheck anything that's not MLA. And then that just cleans it up so that you only have MLA data sets. And then what we're going to do is I'm just going to select all this stuff here. I'm going to copy it into a new sheet. So now you have a clean sheet that's not filtered that has just MLA programmed. So with this sheet uh, in view, I'm just going to go to file, save as, and I'm going to save into this, this uh, data folder. I'll call this one MLA uh, schools. Then in the type there, we'll just save it as a CSV. So right there, choose that, save, and then just, just click OK through that. I'm just going to do click on create a new map right there. And then it brings up a Google map. And then right there in the uh, table of contents on the left, there's this import button right there. It says import data from a CSV file. So we're going to import that file that we just created. So I click on that, choose a file from your device. And I'm going to choose in the data folder that MLA schools CSV we just created. So I click open, then uploads that, check that, check that, check that. And then we'll just click continue. A column to title your markers, which we'll simply use the CHEA profile, which is the university's name. Just finish. What you see now is you've created a map of all the universities, including Auburn right there. How's the internet now? Is it smooth? Is it, does, does my arms have lag or anything? So sorry. What I say, what I does, I went around and I took the ethernet cord. And I just plugged it directly. I was like running on Wi-Fi. I don't know. Maybe ethernet is the way to go. No lag, no lag. Here, uh, one second. <sighs> this is my this is my apology, my apology cat for you all. It's a, a little cameo, cameo from me. Okay, now you forgive me for my internet internet problems. Okay, because we brought a cat into the into the video. Okay, so let's continue. Um, share my screen. I have one final uh, tutorial, and that is getting into the process of taking taking data and being exporting that out into maps that you can create for whatever reason you need maps for. And uh, what I wanted to show you all was this right here. 
this, you need to log in using your ArcGIS email um, that Auburn has given you um, because it's an online tool. But if you go in here, this allows you, this is very powerful. This allows you to create your own custom base maps. The reason this is powerful and important is because any map you create needs some kind of base to it, needs some kind of background. And a lot of times that takes up more time than you think, the creation of a base map. But the truth is all that information is already available and it's already available in the base map. And so all you need to do is just use the base map tool and customize it to a, some kind of visual style and then use that for your work. And so in this website here, you can find a bunch of pre-made base maps. Um, some of them have interesting looks to them. Like this one says, this one called community, for instance, right here, this looks very similar to Google. Pick one of these base maps as a starting point. I'm going to choose, say, for instance, uh, light gray canvas, which I think is a nice neutral style. So you choose that, then choose select style in here. And on the right side of this window here, use a preview of the map. You can click on any feature in here and customize it. So let's say, for instance, you want to customize the background color. So I just click on the background somewhere and it basically brings up the color options for that background. And right now it's some kind of gray. What you can do in here is you can basically choose color there and maybe give it a white. So now it's a, it's a white color. You can choose these urban areas like this one right here if you want you can give it uh, a different color so maybe it's choose yellow or something and so you see here like this is a very easy way to begin to define you know the, the look and feel of a map the thing that you want to be able to do is to be able to create these base maps and get a general style set up here and then just use this as your base map but once you have a general style that you are happy with you simply choose this save as button on the left side right there, save as, and then just give it a name. I'll call this one Frank's gray base, or you can give it any name you want. And then here in the share with option right there, me private is okay. So I'll just choose save style. So now in GIS, if you go to your catalog, the portal of the catalog, and then you go to your content. See, Frank's gray base is now in your catalog. This is your online list of players in there. So I drag this into the map. And now you see that base that we just created is now inside ArcGIS. And now if I zoom in, you see it has all the aesthetics that we've chosen in there. And then the last part is you want to take this and you want to export that to a map. So in the insert tab at the top, we'll create a new layout, choose layout. And uh, we're going to choose ArchD 24 by 36 for this tutorial here. We're going to add a map frame. So create, you click and drag map uh, what you can do is uh, in here you can activate this map frame so go to layout activate right there you can zoom in to create basically a, an area a layout close activation now you just export this out so we'll go to share uh, export layout and then there's a vector pdf uh, right there so choose vector pdf and then in here uh, i'll so i choose svg save it to some location. In this case, it's saving to my desktop. I'll just call this one map south because it's south of the United States. A vector resolution right here. I recommend as long as there are no, uh, it's just a base map here. This can be a high number. So I'm going to just make it 600 DPI. Embed fonts, have that checked. With all that, remember these settings, I believe just hit export down in the bottom right of this layout. So I hit export. So what we do is we go open and we open that SVG file right there. Come on, Illustrator, come on. Oh, here we go. It just took uh, like forever. Yeah, okay, there we go. Okay, and that's it. So if I hit Control Y on my keyboard, that brings up the vector view. And so you can see that this is a vectorized map, which basically means that you can edit it. And so quick, a few quick techniques you can use. Um, choose the direct selection tool in Illustrator, this little white arrow on the left of the uh, toolbar there, and choose any like feature that's obviously a feature such as this water here. So I'd click on the water, then it chooses one feature of that water, and then you can do select same fill color, and now you've selected all the things that are of that color. Now you can adjust like the color of that water. Maybe you want to make it less blue. Basically, you should be able to edit everything on the map. This is style that I created. So let me export that. Share. Export is a vector PDF. Same things that we just did. Let me save it 
as an SVG, go in here, save it into my desktop. We'll call this one test layout SVG. All this stuff is the same 600 DPI embed fonts. All that's good. So I'll just choose export. Okay. Open test layout. Okay. Okay. So this one, it worked. I guess this is just kind of trial and error in terms of figuring out what objects vectorize and which don't, but uh, the gist is the same. Basically, you can go in here, you can select any object, you could change the visualization, but in this case, the text is brought in. So I can say, for instance, choose a, a letter there, select same field color, and it, brings, it selects all the objects that are of that particular text. Then you can, in Illustrator, create a new layer and bring that information to a new layer. Um, you can also do this, you can select a text object, or either do this font select object, all text objects, and it selects all the objects that are text, like you see here, and you can bring that into another layer. Like so, and now basically you can go in here and say, for instance, choose, you know, the state name there, and you can go to town with your graphic um, ideas, whether changing the font is, you know, something like that. You don't need to create base maps anymore. Just use this tool here that allow you to create this background and then focus on the data that overlays on top of it. So hopefully you see that's how we're, we're teaching GIS this, this semester, which is kind of like introducing basic skills, then building it and building it and building it and building it until you finally have um, all the skills you need to finish either studio work or work in other classes of that. Mimi, say goodbye to everybody. Bye. All right, I'll see you guys later.